Hello and welcome to the Troubadour podcast. Today we are going to be reading Infant Joy and Infant Sorrow by William Blake. Now, we've been covering the Songs of Innocence and Experience, and this is one of the, in, the Infant Joy, I should say, is one of the last poems in the Songs of Innocence. After this, there is a dream and on another's sorrow, and then that's it for Songs of Innocence. And then we get into Songs of Experience. Now, if you have been following along, you know that these books were written separately, but put together in 1794. So Songs of Innocence in seven, was written in 1789, Songs of Experience in 1794, but they were combined in 1794. And I don't know enough about how to take Songs of Innocence by itself. I think they are primarily meant to be put together. And that's how I think we should take them. That's my personal take on this, is that you should take them together. You can, of course, read Songs of Innocence by itself and get something out of it. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is today as we're wrapping up the uh, the series. But I think it really helps to put them together because his subtitle is Showing the Two Contrary States of the Human Soul. Now, before we get into this po- these poems, I want to talk about why. Why should we care about this? And I've talked about this before, but I wanted to make it explicit. One, because we're getting to the end of one of these um, set- series. But two, because these are probably the two shortest poems in the book. Infant Joy is 50 words and Infant Sorrow is 45 words. So these are very, very short words. And our uh, poems. And I think if you were to read this, like if you were to just read this infant joy by itself, if you were to hear it in a classroom, for instance, t- teach it to your kids or have it taught to your to yourself as a kid, it's not going to do much. I don't find it that worthwhile in comparison to a lot of poems that we've explored here that you know on just on this podcast over the last year or so that are much better in and of themselves these poems infant joy and infant sorrow in particular and a few of the other ones in this series are not really that worthwhile by themselves there are exceptions i think the echo in green echo in green is a great poem by itself um you know, some of the ones, Holy Thursday is a pretty good one. The Little Black Boy and the Chimney Sweeper, sweep, sweeper are both very good poems by themselves. The Tiger is an excellent one. The Garden of Love. So there are a few, but there are also a, a lot that are not that special by themselves. So in other words, there's the kind of canon that if you've heard of William Blake or a William Blake song, you've prob- or, or any of his poetry, it's probably from... The Songs of Innocence and Experience, you know, and he's written a lot more than that, but that's probably what you've heard of it from. And it's probably something like The Garden of Love or The Tiger. Like those are the poems you've probably heard if you've heard any. And that's fine. Those are good. But what I'm challenging you to do is there's not, you know, there's, it's not that long of a book, The Songs of Innocence and Experience, but there's actually a lot in it to think about as a work of art. And that's what I think is what I'm, what I'm trying to argue here and the value of looking at a work of art. So I don't know that infant joy by itself is a great work of art, but it is a great work of art in the context of the entirety of the book, the songs of innocence and experience. And when you put it together, especially the way that William Blake wanted you to experience it with which is if you um, look on my, if you're watching on uh, Facebook or YouTube, you can see the image that he hand drew and hand colored for infant joy. And he wants you to experience these images, the pictures, the paintings with the words. They go together. They're not separated. And that's part of the experience, part of understanding the entirety of the artwork that he's trying to create. It's not, you know, an irrelevant aspect of, or or just a fun little 
coloring book. This is he's trying to show you something that's important in his overall theme. So let's let's start actually by just reading Infant Joy and talking about it. It's so simple, it won't take long to read, and I don't think it'll take that long to talk about. But I want to bring out one of the major themes that he's been or activities he's been doing in this series illustrated in this poem um, very clearly. Infant Joy by William Blake. I have no name. I am but two days old. What shall I call thee? I happy am. Joy is my name. Sweet joy befall thee. Pretty joy, sweet joy but two days old. Sweet joy I call thee. Thou dost smile. I sing the while, sweet joy befall thee. That's it. That's pretty simple. And it's supposed to be simple. It's supposed to be very basic. So one of the themes we've seen in many of these poems is um, you know, when you think about the little black boy, the chimney sweeper in particular, or even spring or night, or even the echoing green descent, like a lot of these poems, a dominant theme throughout is giving voice to the voiceless. And this poem makes that explicit because infant means without voice or in, in Latin, it means voiceless essentially. And that's one way that we differentiate infants from children, from you know, hu- from fully grown adults, is that infants can't speak yet. And speaking, language, communication, that is a fundamental to human existence. It's something that only humans can do. I know a lot of people think that animals communicate, but I don't think that's actually what's happening with animals. Um, not real communication. I think there, there's something that we could you know, discuss at some point, my view is that there's some kind of evolutionary, evolutionarily, uh, a shaking, a startling that kind of warns or, or that you, the animals have evolved to react to, but it's not the same thing as, you know, communicating a sonnet, a love story, um, you know, a critical analysis of James Joyce's Ulysses. You know, it's not the same thing when a zebra startles and it's communicating by something by the way it startles when there's a ze- when there's a lion out there and then all the other zebras around it who startle quickly in relation to the first startled zebra. That's a communication. One zebra startles, all the other zebras, zebras around it startle as well. The ones who don't get eaten by the lion and they don't procreate and they don't, you know, pass on that startle quickly gene. That I think is the essence of what quote unquote could be considered all animal communication, even on the higher levels of animal communication. It has something to do with that kind of process. And it's not the same as being able to write a treatise on politics. And it doesn't even have, you know, they're categorically different. It's not like an issue of, um, um, manner or, or height or, or, you know, slightly going up, ascending the, the communication ladder from startling to, uh, the Principia. That's not what is going on here. It's a categorical difference. So I think there is that, you know, but then the question is, and I think what Blake is expressing here is a very, profoundly important question that we still struggle with to this day. And you have answers to it, whether you realize it or not. Are we born with sin or are we born blank or are we born good and made evil? Is there a spectrum? How do we know? Where do we decide this? These are important questions that are being questioned at this time, really for the first time in a long time, and and, um, if not ever. So you have, during the 1790s, a whole revolution about the way we think about the world and ourselves. And in this case, you have, for instance, the Romantics, the William Wordsworths, the Blakes, following somewhat in the vein of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote in Emile, Our Own Education, a treatise about the natural methods 
important to training a child. And his whole view is that you have all these constraining elements on a child that molds a child into what we want them to be, but really distorts them from their natural process. And, and what we want to do is emulate, you know, how uh, animals and plants in particular vegetation lets their, you know, lets newborn creations come into being and to be raised into adulthood is that it's just a natural process. And there very much was that view that things like books and uh, schooling destroyed children more than help them. And I, there is some good argument there. I, you know, I went to public education. I went through public schooling and I don't think it did much good for me overall, not for my character, not for my social abilities, not for my mind in training my mind to think, uh, you know, to process facts and to integrate facts and to question context and to make sure I have the proper, like, I don't think I got any of that. Uh, in school. I think anything I have of that came outside of school in my own, you know, um, attempts to improve myself. And the point is that there is this questioning that is going on at this time in the 17, uh, late 1700s during the birth of Romanticism. And what we're seeing in um, this poem is, you know, an infant joy, and we'll read Infant Sorrow, which is the flip side to Infant Joy, of course. And what we're seeing is that view of, hey, here is um, William Blake's view. And his view isn't necessarily that it's only joy, by the way. He is showing the two contrary states of the human soul. And he believes these energies, innocence and experience, are facts that constantly and always battle it out within us. And they're real. They're real things. So there is joy. And there is experience and, and we have to kind of, you know, develop our own understanding of that through them. But let's go through the poem a little bit. I just wanted to set up this kind of idea of giving voice to the voiceless ones and that this is a question that's important in the 18, it's important at all times, but that they're really starting to question and, and explicitly talk about in the 1700s is, are we born evil? Are we born good? You know, are we born great? Are we or are we made? And, and what types of manner does um, society impinge on us? What does it impinge on us? So let's look at this carefully. So it starts off by saying, I have no name. I am but two days old. So we have this creation that's born. It's called infant joy. We, we, and he is talking in the first person. And then there's a hard dash. And I think that's also in the version I have on my there's no, there's not a hard dash in my version. So this, um, maybe we can see in the, yeah. So in the, in the, uh, picture I'm seeing that it was hand drawn by William Blake, I am seeing a period and an M dash. So it looks like there's a hard stop here. I have no name. I am, but two days old, hard stop. What shall I call thee? Now in there, I think we're getting something like the mother talking, right? You even have a picture of a little angel. They're, they're like in the image, they're on this flower petal that's blo that's blooming. And within that, there's like a female with wings, a little girl, it looks like maybe, you know, a teenage girl. And then there's a mother who's wearing like a, I think a purple or pink gown and she's holding her two day old baby. And, you know, it says, I have no name. What uh, I am, but two days old, what shall I call thee? So I think that's the mother or maybe the angel in this picture that's talking is saying, what shall I call thee? And then the baby, I believe, re replies, I happy am. Joy is my name. Sweet. And then I think it, it, there's another hard stop. And it says, sweet joy befall thee. Now, <clears throat> that, we, that idea of sweet joy befall me is very simple and easy to cross to pass over. But I want to pause on it for a second because we have this scenario where a baby is being named and it's done in this whole poem is done in a very repetitive manner. Um, I am, but two days old is repeated, you know, sweet joy, but two days old is repeated, you know, in the second stanza, um, there's only 50 words and six of those words are joy. Uh, what shall I call thee? I happy am joy is my name. And so we have this community between the, that's not irrelevant, between the infant 
and, and joy. The infant is joy. I happy am. Joy is my name. Identity, nature is joy, infant, baby. They're all combined together. And then there's the wish, sweet joy befall thee. Sweet joy unto you. Why would we say something like that? If we lived in a perfect, easy, simple world where, you know, a, a, a Garden of Eden, where everything was honky dory and beautiful, and we could just pick flowers and, you know, eat berries and, you know, make love under trees and under bowers, and, and that's it. Sweet joy befall that you wouldn't have to wish for some joy to happen to somebody, would you? You wouldn't have to wish joyfulness to a person because they would just always have it. So this implies, I think, in a way of not letting people know that joy doesn't necessarily happen. It may not happen to you. You may not get it. I'm going to wish it so that it, I wish that it does happen to you, right? And there's even in the picture, a, you know, a, this you think of like a guardian angel or some kind of angel there. And it's kind of like, you know, a prayer. I wish on my child happiness or joy because it is joy. And I hope that it maintains that. And then I think we get in the second stanza, the mother talking, pretty joy, sweet joy, but two days old. Sweet joy, I call thee, thou dost smile, I sing the while, sweet joy befall thee. So we get that, again, the repetitiveness of the sweet joy befall thee, which gives a kind of, the, the, all, the repetitiveness, by the way, um, in terms of the tone, I think gives a rocking nature you know, two days old, but two days old, sweet joy befall, sweet joy befall. I think it kind of has like this, you know, she's rocking him feel to the, the language and the, uh, the, the use of the language. So the mother is very happy, pretty joy, sweet joy, but two days old, sweet joy, I call thee. You, you do smile, thou dost smile, you do smile, I sing the while. So his smiles... The, or the infant smiles, his or her smiles, cre causes the mother to sing, and then again pray more for sweet joy to befall thee. Very straightforward. There's not a lot to think about. You know, again, I think it's all you. The the maybe more advanced way to look at it is the kind of rocking na nature, and the the unity between joy and and um you know the infant that it is, and, and you know. It, that is what it is. That's the nature and the identity of the infant. And that's really what there is to this poem. There's not a whole lot other than that. But in the context of the Songs of Innocence and Experience, we get this feeling of another way of Blake trying to give voice to something that doesn't have voice. And to better understand what the voice is, so this is a two-day child, well, what is the opposite or the opposing or the antithesis to this joyful child. And that would be a sorrowful child. And that's where we get the, um, in the songs of experience, infant sorrow. Now in infant sorrow, you can see the picture is a little bit different. So although the child in, in um, infant sorrow looks like a, like a one year old, at least like it's quite big in the poem itself, it was literally just birthed. Like this is the just birthing moment. But we are getting a different scene. So the child in this picture drawn by William Blake is crying, sad, devastated. The mother's picking her up. And if you look at the mother's face, it's hard to see in this image, but she's not necessarily happy. I don't know if you could see this. There we go. You know, in the other one, it's a little hard to tell. They don't look very happy either, I guess. So it, I don't know that either of them look particularly happy. But in here, she, you know, the, the look I'm getting is is almost kind of like a frustration and um, just not a happy moment. And we're not getting a happy moment. So let's read this poem, Infant Sorrow, and then we can kind of look at them together. My mother groaned, my father wept, into the dangerous world I leapt. Helpless, naked, piping loud, like a fiend hid in a cloud. Struggling in my father's hands, 
striving against my swaddling bands. Bound and weary, I thought best to sulk upon, to sulk upon my mother's breast. So here, again, you could probably even just on a first reading tell there's something not as pleasant going on. My mother groaned, my father wept. So, you know, probably the birthing pains. This is the first experience of the world the baby has. Now, to understand this one view that Blake and Wordsworth and others of this time were arguing, especially the Romantics, and especially Blake and Wordsworth, and I think Wordsworth really plays this out a lot more uh, in his poetry, and you can see this in, in some of the poems we expressed or uh, talked about in lyrical ballads, he has a view that children before they're born are formed in heaven. So there's kind of like this forging of the baby, the baby's put into the womb, and then when it comes out, then it has it starts gaining experiences through its sensory experiences, through looking, hearing, seeing, you know, feeling, touching, tasting. And that's how, it, you know, and, but as it does that, it kind of loses some of that heavenly um, miasma, or that's not the right word, or, or, or coloring, I guess you could think, a shading of heaven that has uh, touched the infant and that's still there at, when it's born, because it does feel like a, such a miracle, right? Like when we think of birth, we think of the miracle of birth. And there's still a lot we don't know about that whole process. There's still a lot of very specific things that with all the advancements in medical, um, you know, all the medical advancements, we don't really know that much. It's still, and definitely in the 1700s, it seemed quite miraculous. And so they have this, this view that there's this, in, uh, this entity that was born, it was just in heaven. And that's why there becomes this kind of reverence for the infant, one of the interesting things about um, painting, looking at paintings throughout history, is to see how different entities are uh, identified in the way that they're drawn. So you can go back to even this time period and some you know time beforehand, and often when you see children portrayed in paintings and family paintings, many times they're portrayed as little adults you know, with their hunting caps and their rifles if they're boys, or they're, they might be holding an apple as a, as a woman to represent her, um, you know, her, her femininity as in her ability to reproduce her sexuality uh, in terms of her potential for motherhood in the future, you know, holding a seed. And, but there's still this, they're, they look a little bit like just shorter adults. And, but then you start getting into this era and you start to get, a fascination with infants, like actual looking at the process of birth to adolescence or to teenagehood, where you might think 13 is where you become an adult. And you look at that whole zero to 13 era, 13 years this is actually a long time. And you look at that 13 years as its own category and its own like special process that is completely different. It's not a little adult. You know, a six-year-old's not a little adult. A six-year-old is a fundamentally different creature to some degree and requires something different than the rest of us. And part of this is because of their lack of experience, right? And their lack of, and by experience, we mean their sensory experience. So all that is to start off to, to kind of give you some context of what Blake and the Romantics are thinking about in this time. And Blake here is saying, you know, so my mother groaned, my father wept into the dangerous world I left. This is the birthing moment. So the the child went from the innocence, the protection, the safety of the womb, out leaping, right? Like it, almost like a shot out of there, out of the womb, into this world of groaning and weeping right away. That's the first thing a child gets. It's a dangerous world and there's mothers groaning and there's fathers weeping. And what is he? He's helpless, naked, piping loud like a fiend hid in a cloud. Now, that's really interesting. You're going to have to read the whole book to get this. If you just read this infant sorrow by itself, you're not going to get this. But the first poem in the Songs of Innocence is called The Piper. 
And it has to do with a piper who plays a pipe. This is an ancient, you know, ancient, ancient pre um, Greek. This is like the first, you know, or in the Greek era, you know, we can think of it way back when <laughs> in the mythological era or before the mythological era, really. And you have people just, you know, kind of playing pipes and they're, they're more like birds and other woodland creatures that make sounds than they are like the modern humans that we might think of, even in the Iliad, right? You have people singing songs and fighting wars. So the piper is in the, the, the introduction of the songs of innocence is visited by a cherub, a young infant, an angel, uh, but in the form of a kind of a baby. And the baby tells the piper to pipe a song. And he does. And the song is, you know, very quaint and it's just like a bird chirping. And then it tells him to write his song down. And so the piper puts his, you know, his, uh, his pipe down. He picks up a wood, a little pen. He stains the water clear and he writes down the songs. And that this, the piper goes into this process of how we go from ancient pre-civilized era before writing and before and we're just experiencing the entirety of the world into writing down and putting into um, the world our thoughts about the experiences. That's a whole different process. And this child is associated with that early Piper right at the beginning because civilization kind of goes through the same process that an infant goes through, or we could say an infant goes through the same kind of process. I don't know if I'm going to get this right. And I know this is offensive to parents, but I'm going to say it. I read this in um, Richard Mitchell's book, the um, nothing less than words can say. And I believe it was that or, or the gift of fire. And he says, uh, Richard Mitchell was an English professor in the seventies or, or up to the seventies. And he um, said all, Infants are savages who become barbarians and some of them become, um, you know, civilized, you know, civilized adults. And that process, and when you think about it, an infant is kind of a savage, right? Like they just kind of eat and, you know, poop and that's about it and cry. And then it's just, there's no language. They're, they're like an animal. I mean, they, we don't like to hear that maybe, but it's true. They're very animalistic in that sense. And they can become barbarians and, you know, six-year-olds can very much be barbaric. And then through time, they might become civilized adults, we would hope. And so that kind of process is the same kind of process that our civilization has gone through, right? We started off as savages before we tamed animals and got together for agriculture. And then we turned into barbarians where we were just brutally killing everybody whenever we wanted to get more of our own, of more resources, something. And then maybe we could form something like a civilization of a more advanced nature. And hopefully that civilization can keep propelling itself. But here we have helpless, naked, piping loud, like a fiend hid in a cloud. So this infant is associated with that piper. And he's at the pre begin, or he's at the very beginning of that whole process of becoming civilized. So we're, we're getting that taste of, you know, what do we do? How do we think of infants? How do we treat them? How should we act in their nature? So in infant sorrow, we're getting this much more negative, much more experiential, much more, um, the, the tone is much darker. And, you know, he even calls like a fiend hid in a cloud. Now, normally, you don't have fiends in clouds. You normally have angels in clouds and fiends are somewhere else. But um, now I don't know that fiend is actually supposed to be horribly connotative negatively. It's not supposed to have ne like intensely negative connotations. It's just a creature that's in a cloud, but that's not an angel. And it may not be the best of creatures in the world. I think there is a little bit of a negative connotation, but try not to have too much of a negative. I'm not getting that hundred percent in, uh, in looking up the definitions. Okay. The next stanza is struggling in my father's hand. So again, his first experience is not enjoying being in his father's hands, which again, you could think of a father raising a child, not knowing how to raise the child properly, which none of us really do. Right. When well, you don't know what we're doing 
and they're debating this at this time as we're talking, you know, as I said about Emile and all these uh, philosophical and poetical and, and, you know, sermons on how to raise babies um, that, that goes on to today where there's like a whole industry of how you should raise your baby. And everybody, every parent knows that you're going to get bombarded with different views on, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Well, in this case, the, you know, the, the baby's just struggling and the father is, you know, holding on whether the baby wants to or not. But w- then we learn what the baby or the infant is struggling against. And in a sense, it's, or what it says is striving against my swaddling bands. Now, this is like the, um, if you've seen a baby wrapped up in swaddling clothes, they do this. It's supposed to help with growth of limbs and to provide a feeling of safety because the baby just came from a womb, which is a very confined space. So it emulates the womb. And then the next line is bound and weary. I thought best to sulk upon sulk upon my mother's breast. So the striving is a kind of like, you know, one way to look at that. If you think about what we do to a baby, we, we bind them up and we put them in this cradle and we unload our views, visions, thoughts, and understandings and our own, impro- you know, problems onto this infant as this infant grows up. And I think the binding process that we're seeing here represents that. I think it shows the kind of, uh, expresses that kind of feeling that, hey, we have, um, you know, what we do to babies is bind them and it's what we do to children. And it represents this broader idea that Blake is playing out with that we are uh, destroying the innovative, creative, innocent, um, heavenly part of an infant. And this is one, and this is one reason why the romantics were much more for what they might call a natural education. And Wordsworth wrote about this all the time about how woodland or the woods and nature, that's where children should learn versus a heavy bookish existence. And I just want to say, that's not to say that they're necessarily against books but they are against beating a kid over the head metaphorically with a book. And I think that is, um, you know, they want kids to go out and experience the world as natural entities, not overly bound by people, you know, by, by their, their, the, the hierarchies around them, the church, their school, their parents. And I think you get that a lot. And I think this is a good question today. You know, how, what is a proper education? That's what we're getting at here. Now, he's not giving you any answers. This is a very simple, he's just kind of showing you and a feeling the, he's giving a voice to the voiceless that this is what it feels like. And at the end, this last line is, or last two lines, bound and weary, I thought best to sulk upon my mother's breast. There's nothing else to do but sulk upon my mother's breast. That's what a baby does, right? An infant cries and just sulks on the mother's breast because it doesn't have the power the, to make its own decisions, to, you know, live its own experiential life and to experience things. Interestingly, there are a lot of movements in education today to allow kids this exact thing that the education system has been in our country in America has been way too constrainted. And so what needs to occur is more of a natural education, letting kids explore things a little bit on their own. And, and in fact, I taught at a Montessori school and that's not exactly Montessori's view. The Montessori doesn't say, just put your kid out in the wild and leave them and, you know, two days old and see what happens. I mean, that's not obviously what Montessori or any education is about. And that's not even what the, the romantics would say either, of course. But there is, you know, but what Montessori, for instance, says is, um, you know, freedom within limits, right? So it's, there is this kind of, if you have the right constrained world in, in the Montessori view, you should, allow kids freedom and you can let them build freedom and give them more and more of the world as they grow. And, you know, personally, I agree with that viewpoint. I think that's the best if you have the right constraints and you have to discuss what you think that is. But the, um, the romantics would, I think, agree with the freedom part. Now the constraints part, they might, you know, have a little bit of a problem with, um, and you could look at how romantics raised their children like, like Wordsworth. And, um, he didn't not teach them 
books and things of that nature and send them to school. He did do that, but he definitely allowed them more freedom, I think, than most parents of his or any era would have allowed. Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, I think somewhat famously, did not teach his children to read until they were, I believe, six, six or seven. So he waited um, you know, a few years to teach them any letters, and he just let them kind of be children. And I think six or seven's pretty, you know, I was in first grade definitely reading at six or seven. So it's definitely later than a lot of people, but his kids seemed to turn out all right. They were pretty intelligent. I'm not an expert on his kids. I've read a biography about him, and his, but his kids seemed to be fine. So it didn't seem to like destroy their ability to read. Um, and, and that's not to say that they never heard words. They obviously heard words. They just didn't learn the process of you know, uh, uh, translating black marks on a page into words in your brain but the, until they were six or seven. So part of the, the last thing I'll say here, I think, is part of what they're trying to accomplish what the romantics and Blake or what the romantics are trying to accomplish is an attempt to um, free people's imagination by allowing and what they believe how you can free the creative imagination of individuals. They were obsessed with individuals with those uh, people, which with us, with each one of us, what you would have to do is start early and let the freedom, like, or, or at the very least, don't destroy the creative element in individuals, which is, in their view, present in all of us. Even the man who becomes a banker and industrialist later in life, he, as a child, has that creative, you know, uh, spark, and it often gets beat out of them. And I, I think that many of us agree with that. Many educators do agree with that. Not all, um, but I think many, many do. And this is, these poems, uh, these two poems in particular, are expressive of what it feels like to be an infant. There's, there's infant joy where, you know, you're, you're wishing for this, you know, this is what you hope for. And it's a very joyful, happy, simple poem about connecting infants to joy. And that's all it's really about. And then you have infant sorrow, which I think is a little bit more complex and deep, where you have these themes about what we're going to do with babies and infants and you know in this especially in this world of experience which is much contrasted from the heavenly world that an infant just came from okay so i hope you enjoyed infant joy and infant sorrow and i'll see you next week